So I'm going to talk about online kinship and assisted reproduction and intimacy today. Because during the previous decade, we have witnessed what we in Scandinavia can call a queer baby boom with a huge increase of lesbian couples, queer women, transgendered people and single heterosexual women who have started to reproduce. And this boom took up with the legislation of medically assisted reproduction for lesbian couples and single women. And in a Scandinavian context, this means that um, not only uh, heterosexual couples, but now all kinds of people can reproduce paid by the state. This took off in the mid 2000s. And at the same time, we see social media, online media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, becoming an integrate part of our social life and cultural life. And I'm really interested in exploring this entanglement. So, so what does it mean that we have this queer baby boom at the same time as, as, as online social media really into our social cultural life? So I'm going to try to, to talk about that. When a woman or a person with an uterus conceives through donor sperm in Denmark, she does not know the identity of the donor but she's equipped with a donor number. So she would know that she has conceived with the assistance of, for instance, donor number 500. And with this number, she can go online and ask, is there anyone out here who also have babies from donor 500? And very often lots and other people would pop up and be like, yeah, me, me, here, here. And in this way, hundreds of parents with children conceived from donor sperm have connected over the previous years, and several of them have developed these new kinships of extended family kinship. So empirically, I work with what we can call really old school social media because I work with Facebook. And the reason why I do that is because Facebook is by far the most used platform for these parents with donor conceived children to connect with each other. Then I also work with the sperm banks websites. Uh, and then I do interviews with mothers of donor conceived children and interviews with fertility clinics. I especially study one Facebook group that I call the Facebook donor group, and that's not its real name, but it's a Facebook group that um, aims at connecting families with donor um, conceived children, connecting them with each other. It's a Danish group, but it hosts members from all European countries and the UK and the US. And the reason why it's so international is that Denmark has become an international fertility hoop. So thousands of thousands of foreigners travel each year to Denmark to undergo fertility treatment because we have a very liberal legislation allowing um, lesbian couples, single women uh, to receive treatment. And it's also international because Denmark hosts some of the world's biggest sperm banks and exports sperm globally throughout the world. And for instance, it's estimated that half of the donor sperm in the UK comes from Denmark. In my talk today and in my work, I argue that online media and reproduction have become so entangled that online media is no longer simply a technology that facilitates kinship, but rather that online media today has become a reproductive technology in its own right. I'll talk more about that. So most people do not, um, at least many, many people with donor conceived children do not act upon the opportunity to find other children with the same donor. But I'm interested in the women who do. And I'll just take you, uh, just give you an example of, of one of them. I call her Senna, that's not her real name, who is a solo mother with a small son. And she explains here why she contacted other donor families, she says. It was Christmas time and I was feeling sentimental. I was thinking about what would happen to me and my child when my parents would pass away in the future. Would it then only be me and my child alone at Christmas? I turned on my computer and I went online and quickly I was directed towards the Facebook donor group. I saw they had a registry where one could see if there were other children with the same donor number. I could see there were some children in the registry with the same donor and one of them had a Danish address. I wrote to that Danish mother and she wrote back immediately. She told me she was in contact with other donor siblings. She lives one hour away from here. And since then we have met 
many times. So I draw upon Sarah Ackman's contribution to the field of feminist affect theory and try to look at here how emotions might inform us of the way that structural norms influence these mothers of donor conceived children. So I read Sana here as someone who begins searching for donor siblings because of a fear of loneliness. So she describes having felt sentimental during the holiday season as if that feeling of sentimentality had opened her to a potential vulnerability within her family. And this vulnerability guides her towards the potential donor siblings. Christmas is a holiday that's often associated with family. So I think it's not surprising that it's Christmas she begins feeling sad about her family situation. I interpret her as having these series of emotions relating to fears of failing as a family. She describes this as sentimentality and points to a fear of loneliness. And I see this as an expression of how this constitution of an alternative family with one mother and one child is, is accompanied by the fear of, divide, of diverting from this image of the happy family, uh, which is the nuclear family. Several of the interviewees, so the, many of the women I interview are also active in this donor Facebook group. And many of them describe the engagement with this group as private and intimate. And of course, they understand that the Facebook group is not private, but they keep saying that it feels private. And they also treat it as if it was very private. So one of my interviewees says, I know it's not a private group and there are many, many members and also members I don't know, but talking in the group feels like when I'm talking to someone in my living room. So I follow this now very long line of scholars who argue that the private public division is inadequate for understanding what's happening online. And in my material, I try to work with how the interviewees express their experiences and they all, um, and they keep saying, you know, that I feel it's private and intimate. Um, so while I, of course, like most others on one hand would say Facebook can never be private, then I also really try to take seriously that my interviewees say that they feel it's intimate and private. I have another interviewee who says, I feel it's like family when I write on the wall of the Facebook group. It's like I'm talking to family. I know it's not really how it is, but it feels this way. So I think maybe we need to try to, to use terms such as private public, inspired by Laura Balang's term, the intimate public, if we want to foreground the user's experiences with the platforms. In my material, online connections between family is just as important than offline connections. And one interviewee, Lisa, I call her, she sees other donor families, but she explains how it's especially like daily interactions in online media that's important for cultivating the family, she says. The media has helped develop our contact and also to maintain that contact. Facebook makes it easy to keep track of the other donor siblings' lives. It becomes a way of maintaining the contact. We don't have to write a lot of things, we just upload a photo. So Lisa here has created this Facebook group together with other families who all have children from the same donor and they will upload photos on a daily basis of the kids as a way of cultivating the family. And uh, to Lisa and the other families then, meeting physically requires time, planning and money, but this uploading on photo is, is easy, it's fast, it's quick, and they, it becomes their normal way of meeting and interacting. And I think it's quite important that in my material, a lot of the families are working class families or lower middle class families, and they do not have means for traveling across the country or crossing borders. And they also do not have strong traditions for writing long messages. So this photo sharing becomes a preferred tool of cultivating the family. This year, 
I've done a lot of um, interviews at the fertility clinics and before I've interviewed parents. And, and one of the things that became very uh, obvious to me when I started going into the clinic was that the clinic staff and the parents speak very, very differently about donor sperm and donors. And I'll just try to give you examples here. So the clinic, and, and that's regardless of whether I'm interviewing doctors or nurses or midwives or embryologists, but, but overall the clinic staff would use terms such as gametes, sperm cells, and reproductive cells. And they would never speak about the sperm donor without connecting the sperm donor directly to the donated sperm. Very differently, the parents would speak about the sperm donor in many, many other contexts than his sperm. And they would use terms such as donor, donor dad, but also sometimes the father of my children. So to the clinic, it seems like the donor does not have a life independently of his sperm, whereas to the parents he have. And I'd also just give you a few examples of that. So this is the clinic staff speaking about donors. So one say, if we consider sperm donors, then it is a product to me. It's not a sperm donor which become a part of the family. So it is something which is needed to fulfill one's dream about getting a child. And I think this citation is really interesting because there's this verbal conflation of the donor and the sperm. So it becomes this unit, it. And of course, it's, it's a verbally slip of the tongue, but I think it's really indicative of how the clinic look at the donor. Another one says, sperm donors are needed to solve a problem. If there's no good semen or if there's no male partner, then they need some sperm cells. It's a donor, not a father, who receives help who one receives help from to solve the problem. But if we look at what the parents in my material say, so these are the parents who go to these clinics, what they say about donors, then one lesbian mother would say, my daughter's donor has a PhD in biology. He also has an ear for music. It's important to me that he's good at music because music is important in my family. Another woman says, my donor grew up in Jutland. His father was a politician and his mother was a housewife, I think. He grew up in a good and nice family. So here the donor is an individual with a personality and a story behind his sperm. So we see this very clear difference related to time and temporality between the clinic staff and the parents' understanding of donors and donor sperm. And for the staff, the donor is central at the time of conception but for the patients, the parents, the donor is, is uh, important both in the past, his history, but also in the future when they connect with other parents of donor children, but also when the child might get to know the identity of the donor upon turning 18. And I've been thinking about this temporal difference. And I think that it's partly related to the fact that the parents shop sperm online Whereas the donor, whereas the doctors, they only deal with the sperm physically when it arrives in a tank to the clinic. The medical staff speak about what they call falling in love with donors. And they warn new patients about not doing this. So they literally would say, now you go and find sperm, don't fall in love with the donors. Because falling in love with a donor is not a positive thing for the staff. And they all have these stories about women falling in love with a donor, and that complicates the conception process. Because if the women do not get pregnant after a few try with the donors, the clinic staff want to change donor. And then if the woman is too attached to her donor, she doesn't want to change sperm. And I hear this story from many different fertility staff members. And then I begin to wonder if this is also rela related to the fact that the intended parents, they shop sperm digitally, uh, whereas as the fertility staff only deal with it physically. So when you buy sperm, and it's like, you know, with anything else in the world, you, you can go online and buy things. 
Um, so you go online to a platform like this, and then you would choose categories like race, eye color, hair color, and then from these initial selections, you are directed towards a pool of potential um, donor sperm you can buy. But when you get to this pool, then the donors are presented in very great detail. And the more money you pay, the more details you get about these donors. So you can get information about their health and their education, but also their hobbies and their favorite food and favorite films. And you can see baby photos and also sometimes hear a voice recording. And many of my interviewees, the mothers, the parents, they compare this process of shopping with dating or with ordering food online. So one lesbian couple I interviewed, they call this, when you shop for sperm, they call it the pizza sperm menu, because as I said, choosing the donor characteristic really mirrors, you know, when you buy a pizza and you choose olives and pepper and meat and cheese according to your personal taste. A number of other women compared this process to being on Tinder where one is presented for a number of potential people to date and where one can pick and choose based on photos and a profile. Um, so one woman said, you know, and a lot of them, this echoes what a lot of my interviews says, shopping for sperm is like being on Tinder. Both Tinder and pizza and the pizza comparison indicates that the choosing of donor sperm is an intimate process. And most of my interviewees express discomfort about this process. They find it's too intimate and they also feel uncomfortable and alienated in this process. And many of them feel uncomfortable because the process underscore the commercial part of assisted reproduction and really underscores the commodification of gametes. So one interviewee said, buying sperm was not a nice experience. We had to sit and choose hair color, height, weight, and those things. The process of selecting all these things made the commercial aspect of our family making too obvious. We just want to make a family, not to buy a designer baby. Other interviewees feel that the shopping for sperm introduces the donor as a person into the family making. So one lesbian mother explains. The donor became so visible when we got all the personal information about him. I don't want to know that his favorite food is pasta. It's too personal. I'm buying sperm to make a family with my wife. Not, I don't want to know all these things about the donor. So for the sperm banks, intimacy becomes a selling point. And this commercialization and commodification of sperm leads to these very detailed donor profiles. And I think it's that process like of sitting on your tablet um, that really also creates these ideas of a potential intimate relationship between the buyers and the donors. So when the fertility clinic blames the women for falling in love with the donors, I think it is a result of this digital setup that mirrors online dating, because that really does encourage falling in love or attachment, and I think attachment might be a better word for what is going on. So to finish up all this, um, I think that we need to see and frame online media, uh, both connecting with donor siblings, but also this buying of sperm, framing online media as a technology that not just symbolically contribute to kinship, but quite literally create kinship and family making. And therefore, I want to argue that online media has become a reproductive technology in itself. I also think we need to take people's experiences with online technology very seriously. So even though I, on one hand, will keep arguing that Facebook can never be a private space, it is not private, then I, I think that we need to take um, into, con to really take seriously that interviewees like mine keep saying that this is how they experience it. So to so start thinking about privacy um, and intimacy as an experience more than thinking of it as a medical, media, technological sense. And then I think that this engagement with a digital technology does something quite literally to our understanding of kinship and belonging. And therefore, I also think that one explanation for the difference between 
how the fertility staff look at donors and sperm and the parents has to do with that the parents shop for sperm, connect with each other online, and the clinic deal with sperm physically as a fluid little substance and in a tank. And I think that instead of blaming these parents for falling in love with sperm donors, then I think we might need to look more critically into the consequences of our global commercialization of gametes where intimacy has become a commercial market tool. And I will end here. So thank you very much. <laughs>